Yo, what's up gang? This is Cash, back again with another video. Today, I'm going to be talking about how scientifically, yes, scientifically, it's possible to be non-binary. Y'all ready? Let's get it! So, before we get started, I just wanted to say that I'm not a scientist, nor am I claiming to be an expert on any of the things that I talk about. I basically just have a master's degree, so I know how to do extensive research, and I've spent hours and hours reading experts. I've used all kinds of source materials, like medical journals, news articles, scientists' blogs. So I'll link everything down below so you guys can, you know, fact check me or whatever you want to do. The point of this video is basically to disprove the, like, penis equals man, vagina equals woman trope and why scientifically um, like non-binary people, genderqueer people, gender non-conforming people exist. By bringing science into this, I'm not trying to be a trans medicalist. I'm just kind of trying to say that the liberal snowflakes like didn't invent being non-binary. There's like scientific reason behind the identity and the existence of non-binary people. So hope that comes across. Basically, no surprise here, the idea that there are only two genders and that sex and gender always correlate is a modern, like mainstream religious creation. Historically, there have been societies that have, you know, always accepted um, more than two genders, like the Mahu of Hawaii, for example, and two spirit individuals from various Native American tribes. Unfortunately, once like colonists and missionaries arrived to these places and influenced these societies, people who didn't belong or fit into a traditional gender role became ostracized from society. So, shout out to colonialism. Mainstream religious rhetoric has divided society into binary categories. Read Adam and Eve, which like, can we talk about how like Eve was created from Adam's rib, so technically she has male genetic DNA, but she was a woman. However, this binary view is super limiting. According to non-binary scientist Kate Hildreth, sex and gender are actually bimodal, not binary. Bimodal means the presence of two statistical modes, which can be seen as peaks in this graph. In this case, the two modes are male and female. Most people assigned male at birth identify as a man, and most people assigned female at birth identify as a woman, resulting in two probability clusters. While it's probable that most people will not be transgender or gender non-conforming, that's not always the case. There are people who fall along the middle of this graph, making gender a spectrum. Now let's get into the scientific proof behind why bimodal is a more accurate descriptor of gender than binary. First, let's separate sex from gender. As most of you probably know, sex has to do with biological determinants, while gender is the socially constructed roles, behaviors, expressions of identities of girls, women, boys, and men. Many people think that sex determines your gender. Penis equals man, vagina equals woman, right? Well, a person's sex is actually way less straightforward than you might think. For centuries around the world, doctors use their visual interpretation of the baby's genitals to assign a sex to a little baby once they came out of their mother. So despite the advancements in technology over the years, many people still think that the doctor's interpretation of a baby's genitals is the, you know, main and only marker of sex. Not quite true. There are actually many markers of sex. I got this specific list from the scientist I was talking about before, Kate Hildreth. First on this list of markers of sex are, yes, external genitalia, which, you know, are visible outside the body. However, in newborn humans, external genitalia are extremely diverse in size and shape. Until about week seven or week eight of pregnancy, every baby has what's called a genital ridge. All sex organs come from this genital ridge. So at the time of birth, a newborn's genitals are labeled as male or female by the doctor, even if there is the presence of ambiguous genitalia. Basically, the penis and vagina don't exist as a binary, but as a spectrum that includes the following. Full-size penis, small penis, micro penis, clitoromegaly, megaly, I don't, I don't know how to say that, 
also called a pseudopenis, an enlarged clitoris, or a standard size clitoris. It can be ambiguous, that makes it a little bit more difficult to place a label on it, especially at birth. In a few places like Ontario, Canada, 11 U.S. states, and Washington, D.C., non-binary or gender unspecified options now exist, but that's not the norm. Another marker of sex is internal genitalia, such as the uterus and cervix, as well as the gonads, which are the testes or ovaries. Internal genitalia and um, gonads like aren't the same in every single person. Some intersex people have a visible penis and ovaries, or a visible vagina and testes. There are almost countless possible combinations. According to Amnesty International, around 1.7% of the population is born with intersex traits. That's the same amount of people who are born with red hair. While not all intersex people are transgender, sometimes because of a doctor's discretion, they can be misassigned as sex at birth while they internally experience different hormones or genital markers from their assigned sex, which makes them have a different gender identity than the one they were assigned. Next up, we have chromosomes. While it's most common for people to be born with two X chromosomes if you're a female or XY chromosomes if you're a male, there are many variations like XXX, XXY, XYY, and XXYY. What this means is that even if sex is the only marker of our gender, according to chromosomes, there are more than two sexes, right? According to the American Association of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, some fetuses do receive chromosomal testing, but this usually only happens if either of the parents have abnormal chromosomal structure or have genes that make the baby at high risk for things like Down syndrome or cystic fibrosis. Since some of the chromosomal tests are kind of invasive, a lot of parents just choose not to have them. So, you know, not everyone's parents tested their chromosomal sex. So you saying to a uh, trans woman like, oh, you're genetically male. You don't know for chromosomes. <laughs> Up next, we have hormones. Hormone secretion varies within and across the sexes. Scientists have basically determined that all humans have levels of estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone, and their differences between males and females aren't as prominent as people may think. During infancy and prepubescence, Hormone levels kind of stay equal among everyone, so there's not a lot of, you know, physical differences between a little girl and a little boy. If they're wearing the exact same clothes and have the exact same haircut, you'd be like, I don't know which one is the girl and which one is the boy, right? During puberty, sex hormones, which are estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone, become weighted toward one end of a spectrum, which helps in the development of secondary sex characteristics, which we'll discuss next. Interestingly though, in developed adults, estrogen and progesterone levels are on average similar between males and unpregnant females. Non-pregnant? And while testosterone does exhibit the largest difference between adult males and adult females, heritability studies have found that genetics, having X versus Y chromosomes, only explains about 56% of testosterone levels in someone, suggesting that there are many other factors and hormone levels. It's not just based on your sex. Okay, next up we've got secondary sex characteristics. These are basically things that appear during puberty but aren't involved with reproduction. Things like Adam's apples, breast size, having a, a higher or lower voice. These aren't always a reliable marker for sex though. For example, some women are hairy and then I know some guys who are like super fair and blonde and look like little naked mole rats, so. Also, according to the Cleveland Clinic, gynecomastia is the enlargement or swelling of the breasts in males. It's most often caused by elevated estrogen levels in males, but it's not as uncommon as you might think. Next, skeletal structure is also a marker of sex. If you've ever seen like Law and Order or some other like crime show, you know that um, often based on someone's skeleton, if a body is decomposed, they can tell if it was a male or female. Judging by the height, they can get a good idea. You can see the differences in like the pelvic bones, the jaw bones, a male's brown brow bone, brow bone, brow bone is usually more pronounced than a woman's is. This is why facial feminization surgery is often common with trans women to get their brow bone shaved. The bones in your legs and arms are usually a little bit thicker if you're a male. Oftentimes, you know, trans men aren't as tall as cis men. But once again, gender is a bimodal probability. Males are likely to be taller than females, but there are some very short cis men 
and some very tall cis women. All of these are probabilities. It's not a guaranteed thing. Why can they be taller though? Next up are levels and types of gene expression. Genes dictate the proteins made by the body. For example, the presence of an SRY gene produces the testes determining factor, and this gene is found on the Y chromosome. Remember, females usually have XX chromosomes and males usually have XY chromosomes. Mutations in the SRY gene can cause Swire syndrome. SRY gene mutations that cause this type of syndrome prevent the production of the testes determining Y protein or result in the presence of a non-functioning protein. A fetus whose cells don't produce a functional sex determining region Y protein will develop a uterus and fallopian tubes despite having a typically male karyotype. In simple terms, the SRY gene and the testes determining factor aren't always super straightforward and again, just by looking at someone or knowing what genitals they have, you don't actually know their internal genetic makeup. The last marker, I'm sure you guys are like, thank god, is brain structure. Both brain structure characteristics and brain activation patterns vary by sex. According to Northwestern Medical Group, there's not really a male brain and a female brain. There are slight differences, however. Male brains are 10% larger than women's, which according to science has absolutely nothing to do with intelligence. Also, the inferior parietal lobe, lobule tends to be larger in men. They would have something hard to say. Interestingly though, a study done by the European Society of Endocrinology determined that, quote, brain activity and structure in transgender adolescents more closely resembles the typical activation patterns of their desired gender. The findings suggest that differences in brain function may occur early in development and that brain imaging may be a useful tool for earlier identification of transgender young people. So basically like a little trans girl, if they like did a brain scan, her activation patterns would match that of a little cisgender girl and you know, vice versa for trans males. It's in the brain, honey. It's not just making stuff up. Okay, so all of these factors combine to determine someone's gender identity. Given how many determining factors there are, can you honestly tell me that every single person experiences their sex and gender the same way and that their sex and gender are or always, you know, and every single person are going to be correlated? That everyone is cisgender? Well, yes, most people are cisgender and gender conforming. Clearly not everyone is the same. We can't simply categorize everyone into two categories based on their external genitalia and call it a day. Not only that, but we expect them to live their entire lives based on this genitalia. Knowing what we know about all the different markers of sex, that's totally unreasonable. A combination of genetics, neurobiology and endocrinology determine someone's gender and honestly most of these are invisible to the naked eye since there are so many factors that are in play scientists have you know acknowledged that gender is bimodal or a spectrum and if it's a spectrum then naturally people fall along the middle non-binary people gender queer people the list goes on non-binary has become an umbrella term for you know everybody who falls along the middle of the spectrum we exist. I'm like not just a liberal snowflake who made this up. This is just who I am and you can blame my damn biology. Many people identify with the sex that they were assigned at birth, but some people don't. That's really it. Let people live their lives, y'all. Like, I, I don't think I will ever understand why some people are so pressed about like, They're like not, there are only two genders. I don't care about science if you think that. All right, y'all, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it was probably long and a little bit jargony, but I hope you persevered through it and were able to learn something. As always, I'll be back next week with another one. Thanks for watching. Peace.